recording is going to start. Samuel, thank you for your, I read your note on the chat. And uh, just waiting for the recording to start. Okay, <clears throat> recording started. All right, welcome back everybody. Um, so just to quickly review, we are talking about the um, the resurrection of Jesus. And we have been just um, presenting, you know, uh, or highlighting certain points that we could use, uh, you know, as a defense to the resurrection of Christ. And so what we've covered so far is we've uh, mentioned the fact that there were the, the Roman seal that had to be uh, broken uh, uh, for the body to be, to come out of the tomb. The fact that there was the empty tomb right there in the city of Jerusalem, right? So, for example, um, if the body was buried, you know, let's say they took the body down from the cross and they transported it, you know, somewhere far, far away, about 200 miles or 300 miles far away where people couldn't go and see. And then they kept the body there for two nights and then they, on the third day, they came back with a story to Jerusalem saying, hey, uh, we kept the body there for two nights and then the body just disappeared. He's risen from the dead. Well, there's no way people can verify it. But that was not the case. The case was the body was right there in the buried, right there in the city of Jerusalem, in the tomb of a man whom most people knew. Uh, it was in the tomb of Joseph Arimathea. So it was right there, buried right there. And, you know, it happened before the eyes of all the people. So it wasn't done somewhere in secret, but it was right in front of them. So that is a strong evidence to say that this could not have been manufactured, conspired by people. No, it was done right in Jerusalem itself. The body was buried right there. The third thing they're saying is, look, uh, there was a big stone that was there that had to be moved. Uh, it's not physically or practically possible for anybody to sneak behind the guards and move this large stone and, uh, and and try to steal his body away in some way. That is not a possibility. There were soldiers. This was a big stone. Uh, two of the disciples or three of the women couldn't get to do this. Not possible. Okay. Well, right, let's just uh, move a little quickly. Number four, a fourth case, a fourth point that we would present in defense would be the Roman guards. You say, look, you've got about, about 12 soldiers there in front. I mean, even if you had one soldier, that man was a trained soldier. He would not leave his post unless something really drastic had happened. Now, you've got a battalion of soldiers. You've got at least, you know, 12 of them there. And... Uh, these are trained soldiers. They're not going to run away from there without a valid reason. Surely the disciples of Jesus could not have scared these Roman guards away from their responsibility of guarding the tomb. No one, practically speaking, no one could have moved these guards away. So there had to have something very big happen to have caused these soldiers to run in fear from their post. And they ran to the Jews, the high priests, and say, hey, we failed. Something happened, which we couldn't control. So this would be another point. There had to have something happen that was bigger than, more powerful than these trained, armed Roman soldiers that caused the tombstone to be pushed open, that the Roman seal to be broken, the tombstone to be pushed open, the body to come out. Humanly, not possible. So 
the only option is there had to be the work of God that overpowered these soldiers, caused this Roman seal to be broken, the stone to be moved, the body to come out, disappear. And when the soldiers realized what had happened, they were afraid, of course, because their lives were at stake now. And they went to the priests, trying to find out what to do. Fact number four. Number five is grave clothes were left behind, which is very interesting. Because imagine if you or I, one of the disciples, somehow got past the soldiers. Maybe the soldiers were drugged. They were heavily drugged and they were just knocked out. So all of them, you can just start, you know, imagine this scene. 12 strong soldiers, so drugged. They're lying flat, lifeless in front of the tomb. And you and I, as disciples of Jesus, you know, maybe five or six of us got together, or, you know, how, how many other people were needed to push open the heavy stone and we managed to do it and we wanted to take the body out. Would we have taken the time to unwrap the body from its clothes? Now, by this time, I mean, depending on when this happened, the, the grape cloths with which the body was wrapped may have solidified to some extent. It would have hardened because we've, you know, it had been, spices had been put and all of that. So would we have, you know, how would, and, and also the, the very fact that the grape cloths were left like that, like a cocoon, is interesting. Or would we have taken the time to try to pull this off of the body I, just depending on, let's say if it was two days later that we did this, we managed to feed the Roman soldiers some heavy drug, drugged food, knock them all out at night, and we managed to sneak in and move open the door. Would we have taken the time and the effort to remove the great, great cloths of the body and also to wrap the face cloth, fold it nicely, keep it, you know, make sure everything is nice and then sneak out with the body. Or what would we have done? Would we have said, let's take the body and run, grave clothes and everything. Let's leave the place as soon as we can. Just logically speaking, it's very likely that if you and I were doing this, uh, uh, this, uh, whatever this thing is, <laughs> if you and I were doing it, we would have, moved the stone as stealthily as possible, taken the body of Jesus with the cloths, everything possible, leave as quickly as possible, go. We are not going to be spending any time unnecessarily inside the tomb to remove the cloth, grave cloths, to fold the face cloth and keep it nicely there. No. So that's another interesting thing. Why would anybody leave the grave cloths behind if they came to steal the body? Why would they fold his face cloth and keep it nicely where it's supposed to be, where the head was supposed to be? Why, why, would, they, why would anybody do that? So that is another thing to think about. I see, uh, let me see there. Charles, you have some thoughts to share? Yes. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> it continues to, to make me move in awe and uh, think more, more deeply about Christ because uh, this Jesus, uh, 
according to some of the videos that we we heard and those that uh, are talking was crucified when he was naked that's what i heard and now he leaves the tomb and leaves the clothes there but he is wearing clothes so that really makes him so unique he, he's so unique in a way that even when he leaves the tomb the clothes that the human beings had put he does not go with them but he is in clothes when he appears to people even to Mary Magdalene because the bible would have put it clear that he, he was naked but he, the bible doesn't say it that means he had clothes so it's really awesome it's uh, thrilling and it's like it takes me and uh, unfathomable i it's like okay jesus it's you now helping me to 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 digest this it, that's what mm. i was thinking while you were talking about the clothes being folded and leaving them there and i was like ah, god you are so special thank you amen thank you for sharing all right so let's go back to our thank you for sharing charles our defense so that's another point that you and i will put forward say hey you know uh, just just thinking logically why would somebody take the time to do this we would take everything and leave as quickly as possible act number 6 or you know the point or case number 6 that you and i would present in a court room is imagine imagine there was a investigation happening uh 40 days you know let's say for 40 days we had crime scene investigation taking place <laughs> by uh, the romans the jews the the uh, the people in jerusalem they're all investigating doing that thorough investigation and then we say okay now we're going to have the hearing on this case the disappearance of the body of jesus and so the judge says is there anyone in the last 40 days who has actually seen jesus anyone and we bring in 500 people we march them in and they give their with testimony 500 not five people not 50 people 500 eye witnesses so mary magdalene says i was the first one i saw him in the garden i was about to hug him and he told me don't because he had to go up to the father then there is uh, you know the two disciples on the road to emmaus said hey we walked with him for almost two hours he was talking to us he came and he sat down with us this was not some imagination we were going to eat food together then there is there are all the 12 disciples and each one of them says we saw him he came in through the door and thomas says hey he showed me his hands he told me to touch him i wasn't dreaming I, i saw him i was going to put my hand in his side and his finger then the, the disciples said well it didn't happen just that time we went fishing and uh, he came and he told us to come and eat and he was right there he sat down with us and peter says hey he spoke to me he he had a conversation with me he told me you know feed my sheep and, and like this you've got 500 people giving testimony in today's court of law if you had five people five eye witnesses that's substantial if you had 50 that would be huge if you had 500 eye witnesses 
case closed. And the Bible saying there were 500 people who saw the Christ, eyewitnesses, who could be brought in to, a, to the court courtroom to present their testimony before the judge. Is there anybody who has any evidence that his body was stolen? No evidence. Roman soldiers, what happened that night? Well, actually the priest told us to create a story saying that his body was stolen, but this is what happened. We were all there. There was a huge earthquake. There was something that overpowered us. And uh, there was no human around, but the stone moved out of its place. And uh, when we came to ourselves, we went in. The body was not there. That's all we know. Okay. Did anybody bribe you? No. Did anybody give you any drugs? No. Okay. So that's the hearing on the disappearance of the body of Christ. You've got 500 eyewitnesses on one side, not a single soul on the other side who saw his body stolen, who has any evidence that his body was taken out by human beings, or that it was a wrong tomb in which his body was placed. Joseph Arimathea, did, was your tomb used? Yes. Were you there when they put it in? Yes. Yes, so we know. It's not a wrong tomb, it's your tomb. So, in a court of law, where there's any normal proceedings to establish or to disprove the disappearance of the body of Christ, the number of evidence, uh, the testimony of these 500 witnesses would outweigh anything else because there's no other contrary evidence to the disappearance of the body of Christ. So that's huge if you think about it. 500 witnesses who could say his body disappeared. Now, the other very interesting thing is this. Sometime uh, after, or in the 40 days from the resurrection of Christ, we find that there were uh, others who, who were previously hostile to Christ. That means they were against Christ, who changed their mind about Jesus Christ. The most important would be the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, which took place some years after his resurrection. But let's just hold Saul for a moment. And let's go to the family of Christ. We'll come back to Saul. But the family of Jesus. So what do we know about the family of Jesus? We know that his brothers, his brothers, and they did not believe in him. This is in John chapter 7, verses 1 to 5. The own brothers of Jesus did not believe in Jesus during his earthly ministry. They were skeptical because they said, man, he's he's just deceiving the masses. Uh, this was our brother and uh, we we grew up together and, uh, you know, we, we did all these things together. And here he's out there deceiving the masses. We're not going to believe him. They didn't believe in him. And yet, after the resurrection, 40 days, or 50 days, after the resurrection, what do we find? 
here they are 40 to 50 days after the resurrection Mary the mother of Jesus with his brothers they're all continuing in prayer in the upper room so you can say here were the brothers of Jesus they didn't believe in him during his earthly ministry they saw him crucified they must have been wondering ah oh, finally he got what he deserved he was deceiving all the people and they got him 40 days later they're all sitting in prayer with the disciples of Jesus wait a minute these are the same brothers who did not believe in him and here they're sitting in the upper room praying the only thing the only thing that happened after the crucifixion and during these 40 days is his resurrection what changed the mind of these brothers it had to be his resurrection it had to be his resurrection these brothers who didn't believe the miracles they didn't believe his sermons they didn't believe anything that he did in his earthly ministry they saw him crucified but the next thing after his crucifixion was his resurrection something happened to change their minds and this is within that 40 day period within that 40 day period 40 50 days you know they're sitting there on just before the day of Pentecost so within that 40 50 day period they've changed their minds and the only thing that happened is Christ rose from the dead so that is again a testimony and of course a big testimony is that of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus which happened approximately eight to nine years after Pentecost so you have Pentecost happening the church is growing now Saul was there Saul was a Pharisee he must have been studying at this time probably you know working towards his PhD studying under Gamaliel and he had heard about Jesus of Nazareth he must have been really following hmm. this man I'm sure he's going to cause a lot of problems he must have been really upset and then he saw Jesus get crucified said well he deserved it at least it's going to come to an end all this craziness that he's been doing and saying so Saul of Tarsus has been there watching all this from a distance he's working on his PhD studying on under Gamaliel and uh, but after his death things get even more intense because it's not just one Jesus preaching now it's like the apostles are preaching thousands are getting saved thousands are being saved in Jerusalem and Saul is watching what's going on he finally gets he graduates he gets his PhD and he says my first assignment after my me becoming a Pharisee is I'm going to wipe out this Jesus of Nazareth so you can imagine a young man just graduated from the school of Gamaliel a point made to become a Pharisee he's been watching all this happening for the last uh, 10 years or so and he says my first assignment as a Pharisee is I'm going to help Judaism I'm going to help my faith the faith of our my you know the fathers by putting an end to this Jesus of Nazareth so he gets you know letters of approval from the from the Pharisees from the high priest saying look give me permission that if I find anybody believing in Jesus 
this Jesus of Nazareth, I'm going to either put them in prison or get them stoned. And he begins his mission. He gets Stephen stoned. He's the one standing there and saying, yeah, I'm authorizing the stoning of Stephen, this person who is preaching Jesus. And then he's on his way to Damascus. Why? Because he's heard, hey, people are out there. They've, they've, it's, it's gone past Jerusalem. I mean, this thing is getting out of hand. It's gone into Damascus. I'm going to wrap this up in Damascus, put an end to it. So he's on his way to Damascus. But before he reaches Damascus, something happens. And this is eight years after the resurrection. Something changes. Very powerful. Saul meets Jesus. And the man who had taken up taken it up as his life's mission, this young man must have been about, you know, it takes about 30 years to get his, to become a Pharisee. So it must have been around that age. But a young man so determined to wipe out this new movement of Jesus of Nazareth to suddenly say, I am preaching Jesus. This Jesus is the Messiah. What could have caused it? What could have caused it? The only thing is he encountered Christ. The risen Christ, the resurrected Christ. That was the only thing. And Saul of Tarsus was so transformed in his life that God used that one man to reach the entire region around the Mediterranean with the gospel. This one man did more for the advancement of the gospel in that first century than any other known person. He traveled to more than 50 major cities in his day. He uh, covered about 10,000 miles on road, about 3,000 miles on sea. He wrote much of the New Testament. He preached to kings, leaders, even bore testimony before the Roman emperor. This was the very man who had taken up as his life's mission to wipe out Jesus of Nazareth. And the only thing that changed his life was an encounter with the resurrected Christ. So that stands as it, and this happened eight years after. That means Jesus well and alive eight years later. So this stands as a powerful testimony to the resurrection of Christ. And last two points that we will say is this. Number seven. Well, we all know that the 12 disciples of Jesus, the 12 apostles, from the day of Pentecost, they went and they preached the resurrected Christ. They had no other incentive than to do this because they believed it. Nobody was paying the money to be part of this mission. Nobody enlisted them as soldiers in some sort of an army. There was not, there was no organization. There was no monetary incentive. There was no earthly incentive to do what they did. See, today, when you look at, say, maybe the people who commit jihad and others, there are a lot of incentives. Somebody's paying them. Somebody's providing resources. There is an organization you can join. And, uh, and, and then, you know, all of that. There is a lot of um, 
uh, training that can be given to you and a lot of things that can persuade people. But these 12 men had nothing. Zero incentive. Other than they saw the risen Christ and he gave them his word. Go and make disciples of all nations and the Holy Spirit will empower you. It's very different from those who do commit jihad today or those, you know, whether it's the ISIS or the IS or whatever, you know, you have all kinds of groups today are doing things, but they, they, they have incentives behind what's happening. There is an organization backing, there's money flowing, there is all kinds of training coming in and weapons being given and all those things are being done. These people had zero, nothing. The only thing that motivated these 12 disciples from the day of Pentecost was they saw the risen Christ and he said, go make disciples. But I'll empower, empower you by the Holy Spirit. And for these 12 ordinary men who had nothing with them, nothing. Jesus didn't leave them, you know, look, I'm giving you so much money. I have registered this organization and I have formed this great entity. Now I just want you to run it. Nothing. There's zero. Nothing. He'd only given them commission and they took it up and it spread. And they died for that which they believed. We can only say the thing that kept them was the fact that they knew beyond a doubt Christ had been raised from the dead. They had seen him. That changed them. It's very interesting that these 12 men, right after the crucifixion, were unbelievers. They didn't believe that Christ had been risen from the dead. You know, you, you know that, and uh, that Jesus had to, uh, you know, if you read the account in Mark and also in Luke, he had to, you know, deal with their unbelief. Who are we talking about? You're talking about these 12 people. That means these 12 men after the crucifixion were unbelievers. They didn't believe Christ would rise from the dead. They didn't. You know, if you look at um, Mark, uh, I'm just, just reading uh, a passage here. Um, Mark 16, verse 13, it says, uh, you know, Mark 16, 13 and 14, it says when, you know, they, when they told the disciples, the two of them, after they had the encounter with Jesus, they told the disciples, it says they did not believe them. And verse 14, Mark 16, 14, Jesus rebuked their unbelief because they did not believe. So these 12 men were actually people who didn't believe. Now, how could these men who didn't believe become believers and with no incentive give their lives for what they believed? It's because they saw the risen Christ. They saw him. And therefore, they could not deny it. They gave their lives for it. All of them except John were martyred. And John was, John the Beloved was banished to the Isle of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation and eventually died. But these men gave their lives for Christ. Last point is that today lives are transformed and miracles still happen in his name. So today, when you and I use the name of Jesus, we see miracles. We see demons trembling. We see evil spirits cast out. We see things happen. We see lives changed. How is that possible? A dead man can't do it. A dead man, the name of a dead man can't drive out demons. It's because 
the one whose name you're using and calling is truly alive. So if we present, we can present these eight facts. to as our defense to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Any questions, any thoughts here? Any uh, I, I, does it does it convince if you are sitting as a court uh, you know a, a Supreme Court judge in Jerusalem? And, uh, you know, uh, one of your classmates presented these eight points in defense. Would you feel convinced? Any questions? <laughs> Samuel, hmm. good. All right, let me read what Charles wrote. Number seven, the dynamics in the 12, give them penis. Yes, yes. All right, the power of the Holy Spirit, yes. Yeah, so, you know, we can actually argue very, I mean, I'm not using the word argue, but we can present our case very strongly, uh, you know, using these eight points and say, hey, look, you know, can you disprove any of these? And uh, some of these are very simple, which, uh, which are like, look, it's pretty obvious, I mean, no arguments about this. Uh, just think about it, you know, and uh, that's our defense. Okay. Any questions? All right. Everybody is very quiet. So I don't know. Uh, are you already think thinking about it, or they're not convinced? Are you are convinced? I see a few comments. Okay. Anyway, I am assuming uh, you're convinced. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. We can talk about it. Okay. All right. Okay. It's a unanimous decision. Okay. <laughs> Fine. So, all right. So these are convincing reasons. And, you know, um, when somebody asks, and if they're willing to listen, you can share these reasons as to why we can say just by, you know, based on what actually happened and thinking very simply, very logically, these are reasons why we would, we can say with absolute confidence that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, right? Taking, you know, you can look at all of these things. Uh, I want to just, uh, I know we have only 10 more minutes before the class, but I'll just kind of introduce our next topic and we will um, pick this up next week. Uh, the next topic that we want to address is on, uh, it's a very simple topic, but yet it's very important. Uh, it's about the, the fact that there is salvation in Jesus Christ but it's not just, we're not just saying uh, salvation is there in Jesus, but we need to say clearly what the Bible says, which is that Jesus is the only way to salvation, right? So we, you know, we, in, in, in speaking about the uniqueness of Christ, in some way we have already answered this question. Uh, but we need, you know, just for the sake of completeness, we need to state this. Uh, and the reason is because, like I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, there, there's there been this ambivalence among certain Christian leaders. And there's this unwillingness to come out and say, look, Jesus is the only way to salvation. So um, for whatever reason, you know, so that's one part of the problem. And the other part of the problem is that there are some Christian leaders who deny that salvation is only in Jesus Christ. Uh, they believe, 
you know, so this popular thing is called, I wouldn't say it's popular, but this movement is called universalism. Everybody's saved and whatever, you know, you do what you want, you believe how you want, whatever, everybody's saved. And it, sometimes it comes from certain Christian leaders and that's not, you know, that's, that's not right. It's, it's not biblical. It's not what the Bible says. And so why do we say, that salvation is only in Jesus Christ. Let me see how much we can cover. Uh, and some of, this is very simple, right? because most of us know this. First, the word of God clearly states this. Right? You look at the scriptures, and the scripture is very clear that salvation is only in Jesus. So I can't say I believe the Bible or I'm a preacher of the Bible and then not say salvation is only in Jesus because the Bible says, Acts 4.12, there is no salvation in any other. You know, 1 John 5, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. That's plain and simple. There's, there's nothing to argue about that. Secondly, why do we say salvation is only in Jesus? Because of the uniqueness of Christ, which we went through, right? Uh, only Christ and Christ alone has done certain things, you know, uh, in his incarnation, in, in what he said about himself, uh, in his incarnation, his birth, his life and teaching, his death and resurrection. Nobody else has done this. So there is actually no competing option, if you want to put it plainly. Nobody else has done that. There's no competing option. And so Christ is unique. That's why we say salvation is only in Jesus Christ. And lastly, it's this very important point that Christ provides a complete remedy for sin and a promise of relationship with God. Now, we don't find that kind of a promise or an offer anywhere else some something that says look we are all done wrong and here's a one full complete remedy which will give you with 100 percent assurance a right relationship with god what we do have is okay you know here are some means by which you can live a better life and hopefully god will accept you or here are some means that you could live a better life and maybe you will receive some sort of a, a higher spiritual standing in your next life or ne next cycle of life. Different options like that, but nothing that says, look, this is a full complete remedy for sin that guarantees you, promises you a right relationship with God and a place eternally with God in heaven. The Bible provides that for us. And it's not based on our works, but it's based on grace through faith. You know, so, you know, we will talk about Hinduism and Islam the next two lessons. You know, how do we present Christ to Hindu and to Islam, to Muslim? Uh, and this is the big difference. So even in Islam, they do have the concept of forgiveness of sin, but you're not sure if Allah will forgive you your sin. You'll find out once you, after you die. And that's why in an attempt to get some guarantee, sense of guarantee, people, you know, commit jihad or they try to die as a jihadist. Maybe there's some guarantee there or some higher possibility there. But what's being offered here in Christ is Salvation is given to you freely by grace, and we receive it by faith because it's been fully provided for. And we can have assurance of forgiveness, assurance of salvation here and now through faith in Christ, which is again unlike what we have, uh, you know, in, in other religions or other options. On all we've got to do is repent and believe in the person of. Christ. So three reasons why we say salvation is only in Jesus Christ. The word of God states it. So if I believe the Bible, 
I need to be in agreement with the Bible. Second, we have discussed the uniqueness of Christ. There's nobody like Christ. There's no competing option. And number three, nobody makes the same offer that is given to us through Christ. This offer of complete remedy for sin and a right relationship with God comes only through Jesus Christ. Okay, so I'm not going into this uh, too much of uh, detail here. Maybe, uh, yeah, this, these points are pretty good. We'll, we'll, maybe we'll pick up from here and move forward. And the next week, we're going to talk about sharing Christ with the Hindu, sharing Christ with the Muslim. So uh, based on our understanding of what we've done so far in Christ, how do we communicate that with a Hindu and a Muslim? Uh, it's not an in-depth study but uh, of uh, Hinduism and Islam, but to highlight the points of difference, differences and how do we present Christ to them. Okay, so we'll just probably pick up from here. We'll just make these, cover these points here and then uh, go forward. Let's wrap up for today. Um, let's just uh, take a moment to pray and then we will close. Any, if there are no more questions, any, any questions? Okay, so let's take a moment to pray and uh, then we will uh, dismiss, go for a break and we'll join the next class, okay? Can I ask uh, somebody to take a moment to pray with us together and then dismiss us, please? Who wants to... Can I pray? All right, Charles, go ahead, please. Father God, we thank you that as we began uh, this class, we asked you that you will help us to understand this because everything is, is you who is doing this to bring even the illumination of this information in a in our hearts and minds so that we can understand it, so that we will be able to even be able to give a defense of our faith. Therefore, Lord, continue to educate us so that we shall not be perishing because of lack of knowledge. Lord, now that we are set to study, continue to teach us that as we go also equip us so that we shall go in depth and learn your word. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Charles. Thank you, everyone, for being on the class today. I will take a quick break, and I'll see you in the next class. God bless. Bye now. Thank you, Sri Kumar. Right. Thank you, Pastor. Thank Amen. you. Thank you, Tarun, Susan, Subhijit, Simran, Sri Kumar, Sayi, Samuel, Salome, Rupa. Rose, Pratik, Harrison, Louis, Kennedy, Isaac, Bula, Beth, Abney, Anita, Alfred, Charles, Abraham, Abhishek. God bless you all. See you soon. Bye now.